It has been exciting to see that new insulins have come in our hands, new basal insulins, insulins like uh, Traceba, uh, Deglodec insulin with a very stable, very long-acting uh, basal profile. Also the more concentrated insulin Glargine, U300 Glargine now, Tugeo, with again also a very long profile. For our people with type 1 diabetes, it's very important to have a trustworthy, uh, uh, basal coverage of their insulin needs. And as uh, exciting development have been the developments on new mealtime insulins, for instance the faster uh, uh, acting insulin aspart that we have now in our hands, but also newer mealtime insulins with a more rapid onset of action and a more rapid offset of action. But as interesting, in my uh, opinion, is not only the new insulins we have, but what we're able to do with them, namely to put them in intelligent pumps that now are talking to sensors and thus make our lives, uh, make the lives of the patients with type 1 diabetes much easier. The whole field of adjunct therapies in type 1 diabetes has exploded in the last years because of the advent of uh, interesting trials like the testing of GLP-1 receptor agonists. We have tested liraglutide in people with type 1 diabetes, but especially the different programs using SGLT2 or SGLT12 inhibitors in people with type 1 diabetes on top of the intensive insulin therapy. Especially the programs with the SGLT2 or SGLT12 inhibitors have shown that you can indeed use these agents in individuals with uh, type 1 diabetes using intensive uh, insulin therapy to not only get an improved hemoglobin A1C, some weight reduction, somewhat a lower dose of insulin, but especially much smoother glucose curves when you look at um, uh, their readings, for instance, with a CGM or with a, a flash glucose monitoring. That is really, to me, the most important finding with the SGLT inhibitors in individuals with type 1 diabetes, that you increase the time and range for uh, people with type 1 diabetes for even more than two hours a day with uh, the adjunct uh, SGLT inhibitors. One caveat with adding adjunct therapies to um, uh, the therapy of people with type 1 diabetes is the price you pay by reducing the insulin dose. You do get an increased risk in diabetic ketoacidosis. Now there's a lot of discussion out there whether the uh, increased risk in DKA you see with adjunct therapies in people with type 1 diabetes is worth it. There is an increase uh, of going from 1-2% in uh, placebo-treated individuals to 2-4% in individuals treated specifically with the SGLT uh, inhibitors. And so um, when using these SGLT inhibitors in individuals with type 1 diabetes, we will also have to uh, intensify our educational efforts specifically to avoid DKA when using these agents. In type 2 diabetes, choosing glucose-lowering agents are now guided by what, by what our guidelines say, but also, for instance, by what we said in the consensus statement of ADA and ESD published in 2018. There we made it clear, first of all, that the patient needs to be at the center of everything. The major aim of all our therapies should be to uh, prevent acute and chronic complications and to improve quality of life of our patients. But also there are specific key patient characteristics that uh, really guide our choices of glucose lowering agents. These key characteristics are for instance presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, presence of heart failure or presence of chronic kidney disease. If you have the presence of one of these characteristics, they will really drive the choice in the glucose-lowering agent. For instance, when you have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease present, we say choose either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit to be added on top of lifestyle and metformin. When you have presence of heart failure, for instance, then we say when you need to make a choice, prefer an SGLT2 inhibitor
to be added to metformin. When you have chronic kidney disease, again we say prefer an SGLT2 inhibitor to be added to metformin as a glucose lowering therapy. In type 2 diabetes, we are really just at the beginning of understanding what this very complex and I think also very heterogeneous disease is. We're getting better insights in uh, how the peripheral tissues react to insulin. We just had a fantastic Banting lecture by Professor O'Reilly where he uh, demonstrated how we can learn from monogenic diseases and really uh, uh, tailor therapies to a complex heterogeneous disease that is type 2 diabetes. But also growing insights on the contribution of the beta cell in, in the whole uh, process of type 2 diabetes, I believe, will really orient our therapies of the future. Like every year, there are several highlights in, in the ADA conference. Uh, to me, this year was, uh, for instance, the data presented on uh, using anti-CD3 antibodies, teplizumab, in individuals at high risk of developing type 1 diabetes. Kevin Harold uh, clearly demonstrated in this uh, uh, trial net study that we can delay progress to type 1 diabetes by up to two years by using anti-CD3 teplizumab in individuals at high risk of getting type 1 diabetes. Other highlights, of course, come in the type 2 field. Disappointing highlight, the fact that giving vitamin D in individuals at high risk of getting type 2 diabetes did not arrest progression uh, to the disease. And then, of course, the interesting studies, Rewind and Carolina on GLP-1 receptor agonist and on the effect of DPP-4 inhibitors versus SU are also highlights at this year's ADA.